Good morning. My name is Sarah Oddsley, and I'm the Writing Across Media Facilitator at the Vermont Studio Center. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for virtual visiting writer Joy Priest's craft talk. Um, the topic today is the Black poet and the deer on the transpositional phenomena of the line. Joy Priest is the author of Horsepower, winner of the Donald Hall Prize for Poetry. Her work has been recognized by a 2021 NEA Fellowship and a 2019-2020 Fine Arts Work Center Fellowship and the Stanley Kunitz Memorial Prize, among other awards, and has appeared in numerous publications, including Academy of American Poets, Home A Day Series, American Poetry Review, and The Atlantic. She received her MFA in poetry with her certificate in women and gender studies from the University of South Carolina, and is currently a doctoral student in literature and creative writing at the University of Houston. I'm really excited for this craft talk. Thinking about deer poems is something I've been thinking about for a while now in my own work, and I'm really excited to hear what Joy has to offer us this morning. Thanks again for joining us. And Joy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks everyone for coming so early on a Saturday. I'm really excited about this talk. I had a lot of fun putting it together. Um, I hope the closed caption picks up my uh, Southern accent. Um, let me mute my phone. So I, I just, I'll start with a couple invocations. Um, this, oh, I just got this book in the mail um, yesterday. And I just was like, I woke up this morning and I was like, let me just read a page. Uh, Ocean Vuong would be a good, like, you know, <laughs> would get my energy, would get my energy in a good place. And uh, I'll just read the first page, which is like two paragraphs. Uh, let me begin again. Dear Ma, I am writing to reach you, even if each word I put down is one word further from where you are. I'm writing to go back to the time at the rest stop in Virginia when you stared hard struck at the taxidermy buck hanging over the soda machine by the restrooms. It's antlers shadowing your face. In the car, you kept shaking your head. I don't understand why they would do that. Can't they see it's a corpse? A corpse should go away, not get stuck forever like that. I think now of that buck, how you stared into its black glass eyes and saw your reflection your whole body warped in that lifeless mirror. I was like, well, damn. <laughs> uh, Ray A. Pro Pros. Um, so I also, I, I'll read, I, I realized in the last week that I have a deer poem in the book, like literally in the last week, I realized I have a deer poem in my book. So uh, I'll start with that poem and then I'll, I'll proceed with the talk. Upon reading James Lipton's An Exaltation of Larks. The etymological origins of both love and hunt crouch hidden in the same word, venery. A bevy, a bevy of beauties can refer to deer or quail on the ground or young ladies. When he says, I like a woman who plays hard to get he is talking about an old game for huntsmen camouflaged in the language so that where two women are gathered, they might be called a whisper. When he says a woman who makes me work for it, he is talking about his desire fixed on the chase, a fawn caught in the clearing of his iris, desire at its origin, so close to kill, a loot of little deaths, bobtailed feather, Medieval arrowhead, footed aluminum, guinea wing, target, quivered, bone, sheath, bakken's dagger, metal spiked, flint breasted, obsidian broadhead, white cloth clout, or a future bow. When he says, well, you can't rape the willing, he means no fun, no sport, no game. A lioness presents her apricot belly, her head sized paw, folded limp around the rifle, a pride of pussy. How grotesque. If a woman is to be worn down one, mounted as trophy, then he can never be sure of her no. An illness of enamoradas, a hand hushed over Cupid's bow. 
So, okay, so um, the black poet and the deer on the transpositional phenomena of the line. Uh, oh, also, do I have share screen capabilities? Can I have those again? Joy, you're all set with uh, as the co-host, so you should be able to screen share. Okay, thank you. Um, how you do this? Okay. The Black Poet and the Deer on the Transpositional Phenomena of the Line. Um, and I wanna show thanks to Francine J. Harris who suggested a couple of uh, similar things for me, which is, uh, you know, uh, this French form of, uh, this French form called the Alexandrine, which talks about, which requires a medial cesura. Um, it's like a form I forgot to pull it up before the talk, but um, it's a form where that has each line is 12 syllables with a stress on the six syllable uh, and a stress on the 12 syllable, but the six syllable creates a pause in the middle of the line. The stress on the six syllable creates a pause right after. So it's a, a cesura as pause in the middle of the line. So that's one of the things that she talked she talked to me about. And another thing she talked to me about was, um, was uh, contrapuntal seeing. Uh, and those things will make sense throughout the talk, but I just want to thank Francine for that. And all, all the poets I mentioned in this talk, some of which are here, and I'm now I'm nervous, so uh, thank y'all for coming. The Black Poet and the Deer on the Transpositional Phenomena of the Lime. This talk is the convergence of two sites of intrigue for me. The first is concerned with a particular type of content or subject matter. Black poets writing about the animal here, the deer in particular. The second is concerned with form, specifically lineation and my approach to the line as a reader and a writer. I was, I'll speak to each interest before talking about the relationship between the two, the relationship between form and content. I became interested in black poets writing about the animal as a result of my own work. I became interested in Black poets writing about the animal as a result of my own work. In 2020, I published my first collection, Horsepower. As the title indicates, a certain animal, the equus, features heavily across the poems, figuratively, literally, and metaphysically. At different times, the speaker watches the horse, empathizes with the horse, learns from the horse, becomes or is the horse, relates to the horse, shares a psyche with the horse, shares a parallel storyline with the horse, encounters the horse in a surreal fashion, wears the horse as barrettes at the end of her braids galloping behind her, hears another black woman being described by others as being like the horse in her physical features, understands the horse, defends the horse, searches for the horse and births the horse. As a child, she knows, quote, the horses and their restless minds. And as a young woman, she passes, quote, the same horse each evening, always dying at the curve before staring, quote, in the mirror for hours with her huge horse eyes. The year the speaker is born, a girl horse wins the garland of roses, metonymic for the Kentucky Derby. When she meets her black father, her, quote, horse mind flickers. She whips her tail. Her teeth are heavy. She peers over the torso of a bronco from the other side. Elsewhere, the legs of a black woman whom she sees as heroic are described as quote, equine. When her car dies, the knees of 307 horses drop to the road. Finally, she finds her long lost Pegasus, quote, black as flight in their old stomping grounds. The equus, with, the equus, which encompasses the horse, the mule, and the donkey uh, is also featured in the book more broadly with the mule showing up 
uh, in particular in the poems that feature the speaker's black matriarchs in Alabama in the early 20th century. Why did I choose to write a black girl speaker so close or at one with an animal, particularly an animal of labor? Wasn't this dangerous considering our history in this country, which begins with Western colonialism and enlightenment philosophy, a philosophy in which European colonizers describe the indigenous women that they encounter across the world with phrases like skittish as unbroke fillies. Was I violating? Knowing that black folks have traditionally been degraded in this country as one process of dehumanization by being referred to and classified as chattel, less than human, beast of burden, the nigger woman is the mule of the world, Zora wrote. How could I write a black girl speaker closer to this animal in action and body than at times to the other human beings around her, particularly the white human beings? I thought about certain collections that had influenced or encouraged me at different points as I was writing Horsepower. Collections like Horse in the Dark by Vivi Francis, Beast Meridian by Vanessa and Helico Villarreal, Nature Poem by Tommy Pico, and Bestiary by Donika Kelly. Then the question became communal. Why are we, we as in descendants of colonized peoples, why are we writing ourselves as beasts? In his monograph, oh, in his monograph, Being Property Once Myself, Blackness and the End of Man, published in 2020 on Harvard University Press, the poet and literature scholar Joshua Bennett attempts to answer this question by looking at several black literary classics. He looks at um, the life of uh, Frederick Douglass, um, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass and um, Native Son um, and books by Tony uh, Zora and Jessamyn Ward and, and uh, some poems by Robert Hayden. Um, about Douglass's horse, Bennett writes, quote, horses are for Douglass a bridge par excellence between the human and non-human realms. They are sellable living beings not unlike Douglas and his kin, that are certainly used for labor, entertainment, and breeding, but also possessed an interiority that is by the rule denied. An interiority that is by the rule denied. That felt close to what I was understanding as a connection between my speaker and her voice. This denied interiority, Bennett argues, ends up leading to a black literary tradition that, quote, rather than triumphalist rhetoric that would eschew the non-human altogether, features, quote, authors who envision the animal as a source of unfettered possibility. Ultimately, Bennett asked some questions that proved incredibly important to me in the wake of publishing Horsepower and during my subsequent anxieties around and continued pursuits of the animal the wilderness, the black outside. He asks, quote, what do black authors create when they are willing to engage in a critical embrace of what has been used against them as a tool of derision and denigration to leap into a vision of personhood rooted not in the logics of private property or dominion, but in wildness, flight, brotherhood and sisterhood beyond blood. Sorry, I'm gonna close my window one second. God, I don't live in the country no more. I'm living in the middle of a shitty. Um, I'm gonna ask that question again because it was like super important to me. So Bennett asked, um, what do black authors create when they are willing to engage in a critical embrace of what has been used against them as a tool of derision and denigration to leap into a vision of personhood rooted not in the logics of private property or dominion, but in wildness, flight, brotherhood and sisterhood beyond blood. Bennett found that black authors deploy animal figures to quote, assert a theory of black sociality and to quote, combat certain foundational claims within the Western philosophical tradition. Um, and I, of course, think about enlightenment. Uh, read the hierarchy 
that figures man as master over everything else and has resulted in our current climate, cl climate crisis and an ever compounding series of catastrophes. What Walter Benjamin talks about as a perpetual state of emergency, a historical rupture. Not non-human, but a different configuration of the human. This is the possibility that the black imagination offers. I also, when I was uh, putting this talk together, found an article by Joshua entitled Buck Theory, um, which, uh, which fo focuses primarily on black male sociality, um, but in the, uh, you know, in uh, Taylor's poem, Taylor Johnson's poem, which I will talk about in depth today is the epigraph. And, um, and some other poems that I discussed. But in this article, he writes, even in the midst of a national context where animal in imagery has so often been used toward invidious ends against black people, i.e. the discursive animalization of black people as a means of systemic degradation and derision, these artists have nonetheless turned to animal life worlds as sites of fugitive practice and possibility. Um, so now that my attention was sharp, sharply tuned to these animal figures in the work of black writers, artists, um, rappers, uh, I began to notice them everywhere. This year I began to collect, to collect poems about the deer by, this is, I was supposed to flip forward with the visual aids, okay. Um, this year, I uh, I began to let co collect poems about the deer by Black poets. After about eight or ten poems, I realized I had a phenomenon on my hands. I realized I had a deer poem in my own collection. Soon, I had upwards of 30 poems, with at least 20 of those poems employing the deer as the poem's major conceit. The poems range from Paul Lawrence Dunbar's Forest Greening in 1905, to Taylor Johnson's Consider the Deer, published as a part of their first collection, Inheritance, um, this past November in 2020. And if you don't have this book, that's unfortunate. Uh, these are the poems I have compiled for you today if you've got in that packet that you should have got received if you registered and or I think Sarah dropped in the chat. Uh, and we'll discuss a few of these. First though, I'm gonna go through uh, uh, a craft talk about um, the line and syntax to talk to talk about what I mean by the transpositional phenomena of the line. Um, so, go to the the poems. Okay. I don't know if there's, there's likely a poem about a deer by a black poet before Paul Lawrence Dunbar, but this is the earliest I've found so far. So if y'all know any, drop it in the chat. Um, so two, the second side of intrigue I mentioned in my engagement with the line as first a reader, and then, uh, it's, sorry, the second side of intrigue I mentioned is my engagement with the line as first a reader and then a writer. When I read poetry, I engage the line contrapuntally. That is, I check to see if the line can be read in multiple ways. Most often, I am interested in the transpositional nature of those lines, in which we can look at uh, Terence Hayes's poem, in which two half lines or demi lines or sentence clauses or sentence fragments, however you want to, whatever phrase you want to use for that, meet and can be read out of order that is syntactically and narratively fugitive. And I'll say more about this in a second. Uh, the point is, as a reader, I noticed the different effects of the line as a unit uh, standing on its own. And what I mean by like uh, two half lines uh, or sentence clauses that meet and can be read out of order is something like, um, The scent of muscadine, the berry my mother plucked. 
uh, you have two clauses there that sort of meet also, but, but more often I'm thinking of something substantial like uh, two clauses that are, are, are distinguished by a period. There's a, 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 um, a, a punctuation acts as a scissor. So thick is in the sleep of an embryo. It is the ugliest berry. Um, sometimes they're really powerful though in ways that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and how they influence or disrupt or suggest um, further meaning with the poem. Um, here goes some more down here. Uh, let the troubled world inside, it was no one's fault. It was no one's fault, let the troubled world inside. Or I could almost see the mind separated from the body. Are y'all okay? I can't see y'all. Checking on y'all, are y'all good? Okay. Um, all right, so so uh, yeah, so the point is as a reader, I notice um, you know these different effects of the line and I'll, and I'll talk about those in depth in a second. But first I want to kind of talk about, uh, I don't know if y'all have been forced to read The Art of Syntax by Ellen Bryant Boyd, but she like gets into sy uh, syntax like scientifically. Uh, and she talks about the two competing rhythmic systems in poetry as the syntax and the line. So, 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 so um, uh, sentence holes, the, the sentence as a whole, grammatically, syntactically competing with the line as, as uh, the major unit in poetry. When a line competes with the syntax that is dissonance um, or what Gerald Manley Hopkins referred to as counterpoint. In other words, it creates tension and tension is good. What kind of tensions does it create? Well, transpositional phenomena for one, uh, which again, I'll get into in depth in a second. But how does a line compete with the syntax to create tension? What are the ways? Voight, first, Voigt presents a distinction between consonant and dissonant lines. Her discussion of the line's relationship to syntax is mostly limited to metered poetry. So this is like the most, I'm, I'm talking about Voigt because I was, I was trying to make sure that I wasn't just talking about something someone's already discussed. Uh, in detail and depth, uh, which I guess would have been okay, but I was like trying to be a math scientist. So I was like, I want to, I want to talk about my own thing. I feel like this is, I, I don't know when I talk to people about this sort of this craft phenomenon and poetry, I just sort of get blank stare. So I thought I was talking about something new, you know, but Voight seems to be the person that's discussed this discuss this in a way that's like closest to what I'm talking about. But her discussion has been limited to, to mostly to, to metered poetry. Um, and I'm not, and I'm mostly talking about poems that aren't metered um, um, by, by contemporary poets. Uh, for consonants, she's talking about the way that fixed meter can reinforce syntactical markers, which she refers to as pacing. These are mostly in stopped lines that are consonant with the syntax. These lines usually end in punctuation and the line is sort of used as a measure to pace you through the rhythms of the sentence. For example, I went to the store, comma, in uh, line break. And when I got to the store, comma, line break, I encountered the bananas first, period, line break. So the, so the lines sort of pacing you through the rhythms of the sentence no enjambment, no uh, fragment, uh, sentence fragments or clauses meeting on the line and so forth. Um, and I don't, th I don't think I have an example of that prepared in the packet because, um, because I wasn't thinking about that, <laughs> but uh, I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, she writes that the line is consonant with the syntax it quote, provides a dependable unit of measure, a pace. So it paces you through um, the sentence. There is no enjambment here. Um, she also talks about the ways in which fixed meter can create tension by establishing a competing set of phrases. In other words, making the line dissonant with the syntax, which is largely what we're talking about here. She writes on pentameter, 
because a decasyllabic line is longer than most of the individual units of syntax that constitute adult sentences, it can more easily participate in large scale musical phrasing, providing the poet opportunities to combine bite sized chunks for new emphasis or nuance. So she's talking about uh, different clauses meeting together on the line uh, and how that, so that's sort of the closest she gets to my observation, which is you know, these clauses are fragments meeting on the line, creating emphasis or nuance to the discussion, to, to the subject matter, to the, the theme of the poem. But I, so, so when I, so when I'm reading poems, uh, they're usually not metered, these poems I'm thinking of, and, but I often notice, so to, to sort of turn into my, what I'm seeing or what I, these, these sort of fun ways I, I've come up with talking about things. I often notice two ways that lines are uh, creating tension with syntax. These two kinds of tension occur, let me actually bring up my talk because that's not gonna be the one. Do, do, do. Sorry, y'all. Uh, okay. So when I'm, so, 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 uh, I often notice two ways that lines create tension with syntax. These two kinds of tension occur when either a sentence is longer than a line or a line is longer than a sentence. The first way this happens is when a portion of the sentence ends up on a line by itself, decontextualized from the larger sentence whole, which can have two effects I'll discuss in a second. So uh, it's sort of like you, you'll be in the middle of a sentence. The deer, so for example, here's a sentence starting the deer bows its six chins to open its closed bud of thorns. So this right here would be an example of a portion of the sentence hole just sort of existing on a line. Um, so that's one way that, that's one result of a line, like a sentence longer than the line, right? Um, the second way this, uh, t this sort of tension happens between the line and syntax that I'm observing is, um, when the ends of sentences or the beginnings of sentences meet on a given line. That is when clauses or fragments touch or abut each other, sometimes one another if there are more than two and are separated by punctuation. And some thoughts on the integrity of the single line in poetry, Alberto Rios calls these clauses half lines. Voigt talks about midline punctuation as cesura and enjambment as the opposite of fidelity to syntax. So for those like consonant, so the, for her idea of consonants where the, the line is pacing you through the sentence, those, would, those, those lines aren't enjammed. So that would be you know, fidelity to syntax. So and she talks about enjambment as the opposite of fidelity to syntax and midline punctuation as cesura. Um, as, as I was discussing, this happens in that, that French poetic form, the Alex, uh, Alexandrine, um, that midline punctuation. But I, but I wanna talk about, as you'll see, midline punctuation differently. So I sum up these uh, two distinct, let's put this on the same page, because this is what I wanted y'all to see. I will sum up these two distinct tensions in the following way. One, transformational, when a portion of a sentence stands as a line on its own, this leads to two effects. A, line integrity, the decontextualized portion can stand on its own to isolate meaning, thereby emphasizing or suggesting potential meaning. So let's go to Christopher Gilbert's um, on the way back home. Uh, this kind of gets close to that, to consonants. This kind of gets close to 
the the line pacing you through the sentence rhythms, but it's it's not quite. Uh, so line integrity, the decontextualized portion can stand on its own to isolate meaning thereby emphasizing or suggesting potential meaning. Something like one of us, though more like a fallen star. Um, in a poem where the speaker uh, is a part of a we, comes up on a dead doe, um, you know, and observes it. This, this comes in, one of us though more like a fallen star star something like this comes in it's kind of like uh additional meaning to the to the to the main theme the main theme is like encountering this deer but then a portion of the sentence whole is left on a line like this and you get a suggestion about one of the members of the we the collective we is more like a fallen star um don't want to say anything else about that her otherness, a light from her eyes facing up, you know. Um, so, so another thing that the other effect that happens is that portion of a sentence on the line by its own can change the meaning of the sentence whole or hold a meaning that is temporarily different from the sentence whole and changes with the line breaks to add additional meaning or give the effect of subliminal messaging. Um, I observed this happening in um, Thai Freedom Forest poem, Roadkill. So an example of that is, so, so what I mean by like uh, a portion of a sentence uh, temporarily holding a different meaning from the sentence whole. Uh, you, I'll just read this whole poem, Roadkill. Oh dear, I'm sorry for your roadside funeral speeding possession of shock and pity. We wonder how a deer dies, suicide? And what of the fender that did you in, eyeless bastard with no regard for nature? This your backyard, black boy sympathetic though, know what it like to lie in the road for hours, the sun making fun of your composure. Oh dear, how you decompose bloodless body, party of rigor mortis, only your head disintegrates into a mulch of leaves. Black boys not as graceful, their clumsy blood shimmers and shames the pavement. Oh dear, dear, at least your death accident, though some will say you had it coming. So I even though there's sort of a lack of, of you know, fidelity to standard grammar punctuation in this poem, capitalization. I would say this last part here is um, a sentence, let's just say, oh dear, dear, at least your death accident, so though some will say you had it coming. But when we get to this line right here, if you look at it by itself, at least your death accident, though some will say, you can read, you can read that as some will say your death is ac an accident until the, 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 the uh, sentence turns to the next line and the meaning changes, though some will say you had it coming. So it's distinguishing that from the death as accident. But, you know, it, it sort of suggests that, uh, you know, when I read this poem, I think about, you know, um, black boys being murdered by police officers and them saying it was an accident, you know, or I fear for my life, you know, this, this, this lack of intention. Um, it, but, it, but also, there's uh, often sentiments of, you, you know, we are, or, or a, a more insidious sentiment of you had it coming. So the way that the line temporarily holds a different meaning from the sentence whole. I wish I could be like, you see what I'm talking about? I can't see your faces right now. Okay, so that's the transformational phenomenon. The transpositional phenomenon, which is what I'm into, is when two or more clauses or half lines meet on the same line and are distinguished from each other by punctuation. The punctuation acts as a threshold over which the two clauses can be transposed, literally flipped and read opposite, as syntactically conjoined and or as juxtaposed to create emphasis on an idea or to draw out the conceit. So, you know, for example, 
in Tommy's poem here, uh, you have these you have these transpositional phenomena like it's inside, isn't the scene, uh, the deer, will, will, it's all the same. Uh, to my body or I won't last long, we never, we never last long. You know, it sort of suggests these, these additional meanings. Last long, do we? It all breaks. It all breaks. Um, I am animal, the long bone of it all after all. I am a broken animal, I am brokered. Um, or we can go to Philip's poem. I'm gonna talk about one poem. I'm gonna conclude with one, one poem. I know this is kind of, this might be kind of all over the place, but um, something like two half lines here meeting on the same line, separated by punctuation that acts as a threshold over which two clauses can be flipped and read opposite. What I mean by that is, the brown fawn has found itself light of the moon. And like the ability to read that oppositely, those clauses oppositely um, as, you know, having these different effects um, of suggesting additional meaning, uh, subliminal messaging, everything I, I sort of mentioned before. Um, okay, let me finish this up. Where Voigt, um, where Voigt talks about narrative or syntactical integrity, I think about juxtapositional integrity and the suggestive potential in that. And I, speaking of juxtapositional, uh, Denez's poem actually has that idea in the title, um, juxtaposing the road killing my body, which is kind of, I think the major you know, theme behind a lot of dear poems written by black poets and sort of our obsession or return to this, this particular animal. Um, where Boyd thinks about the punctuation in the middle of the line as a sejura, I want to think about it in the work of these poets as a pause and then a breath, a real consideration, and then a trans-dimensional threshold where on the other side exists the imaginative possibility of an elsewhere or other than that combats certain foundational claims within the Western canonical tradition. Not non-human, but a different configuration of the human. This is the possibility that the black imagination offers. Though I'll discuss both phenomena, the transformational and the transpositional as I have, it is the latter that I'm most interested in for the purposes of this discussion. So I'll just brief, briefly look at a couple more poems before I move to Taylor's poem. Um, but, you know, sometimes what'll happen is there's just many different phenomena that can occur transpositionally in the ways that I'm talking about. And uh, one of those uh, I saw just now in um, Ty's poem is a, uh, the, you know, the line can act as definition. The, the, a portion of the sentence being isolated on a line by itself can act as definition like this, funeral, speeding possession, procession of shock and pity, right? Um, another thing that can have, another thing I observe happening a lot is like, uh, sometimes the, the uh, transpositional, won't occur until the very last line or like the end of the poem. And it makes me think about like what the poet was attempting. Were they attempting meter? Were they attempting something where the line was working to pace you through the sentences? Here's a villanelle by Kiki Petrosino. And she's like, just queen of villanelles. But, um, you know, we get mostly consonant in stopped lines through this. Maybe there's like one here. Um, and then one here, tell me again how from all the dead between us, um, I'll, from all the dead between us, tell me again how I only want what I can't have. Here's an example of meaning changing or meaning tempor temporarily being held differently. Uh, but really the sort of transpositional phenomena doesn't really strongly occur until the end when it's like, I don't know what I want, I only love. 
And then what I'm Lord of, teach me or nothing else. And I mean, I mean, when I look at these dear poems, they really get at that idea of a of a particular sociality in which we live and a possibility of something else. And here I feel like it's, you know, this internalized uh, colonialism, teach me or else what I'm Lord of, teach me or else. Um, next to the next to these these feelings about love. Um, I want to also talk about Isiola's poem. Uh, ep I don't know how to say this word, y'all. Epithalamion. Ep it's epithalamion. Epithalamion, thank you. <laughs> uh, in the field. And um, I think that word has something to do with marriage. Uh, I don't know if you want to further define that, uh, but um, I, I, I keep, like I come back, I keep studying this poem uh, in the context of what I'm talking about. But again, m the strong sort of transpositional potential happens at the end. Um, you know, you have to read the whole poem for context, but you get to, you know, the speaker is, is talking to a U capital and Baba, which to, to me already makes me feel like those two are, are, are sort of part of the same. And, um, you know, re when I read this poem, I, get, I don't have time to like do a close reading, but I get the sense of like, um, you know, religion is strong here and like the, the male figure in religion as it, as it, you know, sort of patriarchy and religion or how it's often, you know, conflated with, uh, male figures, God is often seen as male or, or and so forth. Um, but it, it, that could be wrong, you know, it's just my reading. But what I'm, what really interests me here is, uh, how the speaker becomes a tool of execution and the property of, uh, of the you. My body is merely a tool of execution, take me as yours. Oh, how possible I feel in your light and I will follow you. You know, so how, how these things sometimes, they, the tension is sort of held off until the very end and how that how that creates extra meaning. Um, so I'll just go to, so I really wanna talk about consider the deer because it's so, I mean, I didn't think about this poem. I wasn't, I didn't build this sort of approach around this poem. I built the approach and then I read this poem and I was like, motherfucker, you know, like it does all the shit I'm talking about. Um, but let's read the poem, consider the deer. Consider the deer who, when I say deer, doesn't know whether or not I mean a single one, though there were two dead and shiny with maggots on the side of the highway or a group of them always a bit lost in the divided woods blame our need to reach or leave each other faster. Consider the deer that I saw dead on the shoulder midday, mid-autumn, whose neck in post rigor mortis pining broke itself again so that the head could face the woods, the woods setting itself alight. Oh, that I could turn and live again, the deer might say, recalling that one poet singing to himself, ruining the grass. Consider that the deer when called won't come alone, purely due to linguistic vagary, who like me resist the gesture towards singularity. Call my name and the whole woods rise up inside me. I is a plural state of being. Consider the multitude before my footfall, how I'm able to crane my neck back, see only myself. Um, I don't know if Taylor was thinking of or has some sense of what I'm talking about when they wrote this poem, but it, it feels like it, you know. Um, I, oh, 949, okay. 
so much happens in this poem that's in conversation with everything I've talked about. Um, and it feels like there's some, just some understanding of that, you know, and, you know, when you get to something like purely due to linguistic vagary, who like me resists, who like me resists purely due to linguistic vagary, this idea that the speaker is, is a, a linguistic vagrant, you know, on the line by itself, that's suggested outside of the meaning of the sentence holds that linguistic vagary and resistance belong to apart from one another. You know, but they meet here on the line, this resistance to linguistic vagary. Um, rise up inside me, I is a plural state. Everything that's happening with pronouns in this poem, how the woods are referred to as itself. Um, sort of the, langu the, the linguistic vagary happening before its name. Um, the, the, the syntactical vagary, the, the grammatical vagary, you know. I hope I'm saying that word right because I'm country. But um, I is a plural state, rise up inside me, you know, consider the multitude of being. I mean, I'm just like they had to have some sense of, you know, that that juxtapositional potential of these sentence uh, clauses um, of being considered the multitude. So I, you know, I'll just leave it there because we only got 10 minutes left and I don't know if y'all have questions or uh, thoughts or um, want to say stuff. But, uh, oh, in conclusion, I'll, I have one paragraph of conclusion. In conclusion, while I mostly talked about this as a practice of critical reading, I also want to suggest this as a revision strategy. Thinking about the clausal or juxtapositional integrity of the line and its, and its suggestive potential as you are drafting, can influence the decisions you make in lineation. It can inform where you break the line. Or suppose the sentence you are writing ends in the middle of a line. The juxtapositional potential can inform what comes next, what you want to suggest that you might not be able to otherwise without disrupting the meaning or syntactical flow of the larger sentence whole. What is on the other side of the transdimensional threshold of that period or question mark? What is sitting right there before your face? What is waiting there to disrupt the narrative status quo or to suggest a new configuration of being? Thank y'all. Joy, that was, I think that was one of the best craft talks I've hosted. Um, it was, yeah, just really, really good. Um, and I know Taylor's in the Zoom room with us. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I, what a compliment to to have your have their poem, um, you know, be read and be in, be discussed. And um, I don't know if anyone has any comments or questions. Um, you can feel free to unmute and ask them directly to Joy. Or if you don't want to do that, you can drop your question or comment in the chat. And I'm happy to moderate. I really dig that, Joe. I dig the transitional. Um, and I also, I think about it as a way to uh, further some kind of like, I don't know, maybe it's like a political sentiment of being connected to the land, you know what I mean? Like uh, that idea of being transitional, not only in the in the length of the line, but, um, you know, with, with the subject matter itself, you know what I mean? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joy. Thank you. Yeah, I was trying to figure out ways to, I guess I didn't have the, I don't have the bravery yet to like assert that theory. And probably I'm thinking about this as a larger project uh, that requires further study. So I appreciate that you, you making that connection to the subject, to, you know, that being pr present in the subject matter, you know, which I think your poem does. Like that's why I was like the one I wanted to highlight. So. Yeah, I definitely think it began in that sentiment, sentiment and then it evolved to, to the more, you know, minute detail of the line, yeah. Uh, first of all, Joy, uh, thank you so much uh, for this craft talk. I was, I've been looking forward to this all week and I'm really, uh, I'm really grateful to, uh, to uh, see the inner workings of your mind, so to speak. I'm still trying to form the question, so let me know if it doesn't make sense. I'm interested in how, 
maybe the way you're talking about or negotiating syntax, how it relates to the black body um, as we talk about, um, as we use animals as vehicles, um, maybe going closer to what you, to what you mentioned, Joshua Bennett saying about why it is that black people keep kind of using these sort of animals as it relates to um, not social hierarchy, um, but uh, the ways in which uh, black bodies have been historically dehumanized and maybe us leaning into um, these sort of animals, mules, horses, deer, how it kind of works as a reclamation. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious about maybe the, how the ways in which syntax um, is, is, is functioning in, in all of that. And let me know if I should rephrase it. I, it feels over my head. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, so like, even though I just talked about this and, and brought this to y'all, <laughs> I guess I feel uh, like maybe I need more elaboration. So the ways that syntax is supporting, like um, supporting the, the sort of the reclamation of yeah, yeah, I think I think that's what I'm trying to get at. How is syntax functioning in these poems, notably the examples in your packet, how they're um, functioning as a measure of reclamation? I think I think like mostly. Uh, th I think that's why I like uh, uh, brought in the Voight because she's like the syntactical scientist, and I am less. Uh, less studied in that area. I mean, I, I don't really, I haven't for most of my life really respected um, grammar and syntax <laughs> and and appreciate when others don't. And so I, I'm, and so for that reason, I don't feel very, I don't feel maybe equipped to like explain that in depth, but that's why I brought in her, um, her ideas about, so particularly in poems, you know, thinking about the tension that the line cre creates with syntax, how it disrupts syntax um, or how it, you know, um, I think mostly like, uh, I'm thinking as a line as syntactical disrupt, how syntactical disruption, like the potential of the line to disrupt um, in these poems. I don't know if that's helpful, but in the same way that this reclamation might disrupt the like foundational Western philosophy. Uh, philosophy, the line has the potential to disrupt the syntax, and and it does in the ways that Black poets are using it in this packet I put together. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Maybe you were looking for something more, but you know we can keep talking because I'm I'm still like trying to figure all this out. So, Word. wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I, Joy, I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts on kind of a theory that you're developing in real time for us. And um, I've heard Carl Phillips discuss how syntax is, is, is a version of power and control because it's the, literally the way in which we uh, deploy language um, and the order in which things appear both sentence the way the sentence moves across the line, this, the line break can break the sentence, and what go what continues or where the where the line break breaks with, and how the sentence uh, moves across the line, um, that how they work together um, is basically like what Voight is talking about. Um, but so, uh, yeah, I never I never heard the discussion of the way that the the flipping of the two um, sentence parts could be read in both directions. Um, and I think that is a really, uh, really exciting uh, also invitation for revision to look at um, examining the way that your sentences are working um, in both directions and then also in the relationship to the line. Um, sorry, am I missing a question? No, it was just a comment. Thank you for that, like syntax as control, definitely I was, Thinking of that or feel that way. And particularly, this is important because, you know, I should say I'm talking about Black poets writing in English. And of course, the relationship to syntax or syntax in the way it's deployed is, you know, it changes across different languages. Um, 
So I should say that. Yeah, and there's a really uh, great comment um, from um, Avery. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but um, they say that this talk really places emphasis on the slippage of sentence and the sentence the line has, has a sentience in that possibility. I think this is, it's super important too, because like as Joy was mentioning, it, it changes the way we read things. Like canonically speaking, you know, things have been set up in a certain way and certain emotions are evoked with words and with syntax. Um, but placing emphasis on, on the, on black person's connection to um, animals and on black person's connection to, to the language that are using itself. I think it's super important to, to say that this brings, Joy brings up like a whole different way to read poems and a whole different way to, to respect, to respect the black artist. Um, like, I'm so excited about this. Like, I don't even know what to do. Um, it just, it, it points to, it points to ways that, that like, nuance can can create less ignorance even if you pay attention to it. Thank you, Sarai. It's good to see you. Thanks for waking up so early. Um, I also wanted, I forgot to say because I was rushing for time, but also like in this packet, I noticed like most, like a lot of the poets, a large portion of the poets being queer, uh, a lot of like queer theory asserted in the poems. And so like this querying of syntax, this querying of meaning, this querying of ways to read poetry. Um, and, I, and particularly in Taylor's poem, like that, that linguistic vagrancy is about the way we talk about ourselves, name ourselves, pronouns and so forth. So, um, you know, how we think about ourselves, you know, it's not just like, the, it's, it's, it's very important to, to, to place, you know, um, uh, the way we want to refer to ourselves via pronouns in the context of how we might reconfigure our relationship to other living things in the world, you know? So, you know, that's, that's queer theory, like the Black, you know, Black queer theory right there. Uh, and so I think I see that most of the poets in this packet are, um, are working in that, in those, in that theoretical space. That was one of the things that really uh, also uh, captivated me about this talk is thinking about the question of humanism that shows up in black studies all the time. And I think this is where a lot of like Afro pessimist thought comes in. And I think this talk is an interesting departure from that that says maybe we have different possibilities or different configurations of humanity or really just sentience at large to consider rather than just saying like non-human this is the de designation slave this is the designation um and it really also opens up to me like readings of like sylvia winter where she opens up human as a species and this is really the first kind of talk where i've heard about like diff like these different configurations rather than just you know that limiting um so thank you for this Thank you so much. Yeah, I really wanted to get Sylvia Winter in this talk. Um, also, this autocorrected her last name wrong, but uh, I think it's with a Y. Oh, stop it. Okay. Um, but I'm still studying her. I didn't want to be disrespectful and just sort of throw her theory in here without like a, a, a you know, so having spent more time with it. But yeah, and, you know, and Bennett, Joshua's uh, work is definitely um, is, is, is steeped in, in winter. So, yeah. And, and, I, and I'm glad you distinguish like her writings about it because post-humanism outside of black studies is a different thing. And <laughs> I don't know if I'm like down with it so much. So um, I appreciate the distinction that you made. Any last questions or comments or thoughts for Joy? Joy, is, is this part of your PhD or studies? Or, I mean, it, it seems like it 
it has the potential to be like a larger um, project for you to, um, I mean, I, I would look forward to reading like the entire like research essay. <laughs> Man, I'm just trying to like, Kevin Young, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, just, you know, I, I mean, I have to write like a 40 page thesis for this degree, but, um, but, I, but, you know, I want to write like craft, you know, books and, and all kinds of shit. So I don't know. I just made, I just really uh, put this into uh, talk form for, for this. So this is kind of like, um, I did it for this, not for it. But, you know, I'm thinking now it could be, I think it could definitely be a longer um work that I could use for for my PhD so thank y'all so much thank you so much for being here everyone um but joy this has been the highlight of my month and I know it's been a, a crazy month <laughs> for you um and I really appreciate you being here with us and thank you everyone else for joining this morning thank y'all so much for coming on a Saturday love y'all bye